Okay, the webinar has started and it's being recorded. Um, to, I'm going to um, read the preamble to open up the Board of Health meeting of November 9th, 2023. Pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and renewed by Governor Maura Healy, this meeting of the Board of Health will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so by following the instructions on the Board of Health posted agenda via Zoom. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access proceedings as soon as it is technologically possible. After this meeting, all approved Board of Health minutes are posted on our website once they are approved by the board. I will now open the November 9th, 2023 Board of Health meeting at six o'clock with a roll call. Tim? Here. Risha? Here. Pramila? Here. Maureen? Here. So now, so we need to review and receive the minutes of the October 12th meeting. Are there any comments on that? No? Okay. Um, do we have a motion to accept the meeting, uh, the minutes as written? Can't hear you. I'll make the motion to accept the minutes as recorded. In a second. I'll second. So the minutes of the October 12th, 2023 meeting are accepted. Um, I guess we have public comment um, on items that are on the agenda. Is there anyone who wishes to make a comment? Um, Maureen, uh, we need to make individual votes, I think. Oh, sorry. We have to call in individuals. Yeah. <laughs> I forgot. I got ahead of myself. Okay, so let's go back and vote on the minutes. Um, Maureen, aye. Tim? Aye. Risha? Aye. And Pramila, aye. Uh, Pramila? Aye. <laughs> aye. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> All right. Deep breath. Um, and so now if there's anyone for public comment on this, uh, the items on this agenda. We do have two participants. Um, if either of you want to make a comment, please do raise your hand, your Zoom hand. I don't see any hands. Okay. Oh, wait, so, I see a hand. Sorry, I spoke to you. Okay, Stephen Lambert would like to speak. I'm going to unmute you. And it's again three minutes, is that right? Yep. Okay, all right, I'm unmuting you now. You should be able to make your comment now, Stephen. All right. Awesome, are we going over the, like, the, the new regulations right now? Is, is that what well, we're, what's going again, on? What we will be the, the board will be deliberating. It won't be a question and answer session. It'll just be the board deliberating when we get to the old business. Okay. All right. Uh yeah, no problem then. I was just seeing what was going on with that. Um okay. Okay. Um, yeah, if so I have I'm if sorry, so just to clarify, just to make sure that it's clear. So this is the the only opportunity that folks get to from the public to make comment. So and then once public comment happens about anything, whether it's related to the agenda or something else, then we move into the next item, which will be deliberating the body art regulations, because that's the first agenda item. Um, but okay. there wouldn't be an opportunity for you to sort of participate in that conversation or weigh in or ask further questions. Is that right, Maureen? Yes. Yeah. So okay. just so you're clear on the process. All right. So then my, my comments from earlier just just stand with like the stuff I talked about with like different HIPAA violations 
um, with like asking about Hep B and um, all the stuff I said earlier. So I would probably just go over that. That's all. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so no other comments from the public? I guess we can move on then to old business, which is the body art regulation, final review, deliberation, and vote if we feel like we're ready to do that. Um, I, I thought it was helpful to hear from Stephen again. We did talk hear from him early in the process. It's been quite a number of months. He actually was the person who got this started because he was interested in having a um, possible guest artist come and to want to formalize that. Um, mm -hmm. It was hard for me to hear all of this. I mean, I could hear them, but do I remember each point that he made? No, I don't think so. But I can say that our, our, our um, changes were really based on very local um, regulations that, that were from Northampton and East Hampton and some from Boston uh, and, and maybe even some other towns, but primarily from uh, comparable towns in, in the Valley. Um, so things that were and our 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 um, regulations, as Stephen mentioned, were quite restricted, especially regarding piercing. Um, uh, he mentioned that some things were legal in other towns, and that may be so. But uh, ours are limitations were the same as Northampton and East Hampton, uh, according to my reckoning. Um, so. Um, and some of the other comments I, I certainly heard, um, and, and also things that about communicable disease is, is common in, in these regulations throughout the Commonwealth. Um, I have one comment I'll come back to about that. Um, and even things like a respiratory illness, I think common sense means you, you wanna take precautions to keep from getting other people sick, like with COVID or RSD or all of those others. Um, and that even the apprenticeship, also the questions of apprenticeship length, they're exactly the same as uh, Northampton and, and East Hampton, I believe. Um, it, it's, it's a three-year apprentice, but in the third year, the person, if their trainer thinks they're capable, can allow them to practice under their auspices and be paid. Um, so it, it's, um, again, we didn't draw these up out of thin air and we wanted to be more similar to the local communities and have a fair, fair game for people who are coming to this area to be successful. Um, and be able to have a business that works in this town. I think prior to this, they, they were too restrictive and didn't allow for that. Um, and I echo, you know, that was my sense from reading all of the different regulations. Does anyone else have comments or have concerns about the regulations? I, I'm oh, sorry. Go relatively ahead. new to the uh, to the board, and so I don't have all the background on what was talked about previously. Um, but I am struck by the comment around the criminal record, and mm -hmm. wondering if you know. I, I see that um, it's a declaration about prior. It does. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that means in terms of are you allowed to hire people with criminal records? Um, is it relevant? in this context to be requiring that as part of, of licensure. I, I don't know the background on that, but um, I would be interested in understanding it better. 
um, yeah, that hadn't been in our prior um, regulations. It is a common uh, declaration in other areas. Again, I guess it seems a little bit vague as what you do with that. Um, I know in some some places, like I think Provincetown, you it was you also had to make a declaration of whether you were on a um, sexual predator list, and that was an annual a check of the of those both a quarry and a sexual predator list. Um, so there, there are concerns, I guess, with the proximity and vulnerability of, of clients uh, in in a in a in a setting that's so intimate. Although, I, again, I'm not quite sure how how that plays out. I, I don't have any background of, or knowledge of having uh, uh, that come up in any town or or city. You know that that I've that I came across when I did a lot of research on this topic. Um, it, if we don't want to put it that in, we can decide not to, we could decide to eliminate that. Um, it hasn't come up as a problem. I had can see issues about that, but um, it is something that we could consider. Um, I, I think, you know, um, many of the information, um, even if it's negative, I don't, I, I don't think it precludes um, any type of a uh, rejection of the permit. Mm -hmm. So this information is some sort of a background information, you know, so you have um, uh, a variety of information here on, on, on types of uh, pre-apprentice training and informed consent. So my my observation is, you know, this does not result in a rejection, but it might be some information might be useful if some violation happens in the future, you know, after the license is issued. Yeah, I, I kind of agree. I mean, how often have you had a quarry check because you we're going to volunteer for an organization, uh, go into, uh, the first one I had, I was going to be at a, a, a book sale at the, at the middle school, just dealing with children in a public area, you know, helping them pick out books. So I think it's a low bar in a lot of ways. I think it doesn't, again, it, an old violation that's settled and unrelated to anything of concern to the board would uh, not prevent lic a license or a permit for, but if there's something that's more relevant to the practice of body art or, you know, other kind of like, you know, for every two years, I go sign that for my <clears throat> medical license. I, I, I think it's part, partly, uh, uh, on that basis, I think that would be something that if something came up, that would be reviewed in more detail. Um, it, it, we don't. I don't know that we need to define what the threshold is for being concerned. I think we can we can get help on that if we need to in the future. Um, I wanted to say in relation to HIPAA violations, <clears throat> I. I Correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I don't think that asking information uh, such as HEP B status and, and so on for licensure of um, a body art establishment would constitute a HIPAA violation. Um, you know, I, the community. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, there, 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 there are a lot of form. There's a lot of health information on the forms that the clients fill out, um, and and I don't think there's there isn't really. I we don't have a place where we ask uh, the practitioners about their 
status because it's more of um, in educate it's education and universal precautions, um, and it, it doesn't. It says if you're infectious, you shouldn't be be treating people, you know, be practicing body arts on people and but people who are having body arts practiced on them should also not be be healthy. Um, and and that em emphasizes universal precautions. I do think we did put in, I know we had this conversation, Pramila, under the de definition of communicable disease or condition. Most of those things were acute infectious diseases like meningitis and mumps and whooping cough. And it's kind of, a, like we said, a kind of a hodgepodge of things, but it wasn't limited to those. And we added hepatitis and HIV. My thought today is we might wanna take that out because that is actually covered under the universal precautions. I dug into the site, the, the, the article cited um, at the MMWR, I forget what that stands for right now, but it's the CDC's uh, publication. And they specify issues of what constitutes a high risk situation for HIV and hepatitis B in terms of both the status of the practitioner and the type of procedure. And I don't think any of these types of procedures are considered high risk. I mean, they're talking about surgery deep in some person's body where you can't see where the needles are going basically um, and things like that. So, um, so I think we can take a hepatitis B and HIV out because there might be some kind of um, concern about being discouraged discriminatory uh, for, uh, but these other infectious diseases are, are more uh, temporary things uh, as a yeah, condition. It's my more- point, My point was really more about whether it was a HIPAA violation or not. And I, right. don't, think, I don't have any problem with removing um, the, the two that you mentioned. Yeah, and I don't know if HIPAA applies in this setting either. It's not um, a medical setting, mm -hmm. but. Can I just ask a clarifying question? When you're saying take out HIV and he hepatitis, are you talking about the section on page three that yes. defines communicable? Because it's also mentioned in the verbal information that you should be giving to clients. And I think it should stay there. That it I is... do too. I do okay. too. I just wanted to be clear where we're right. suggesting I just taking thought it out. The definition should we should, we might want to remove that. But in terms of the risks and uh, the information given to clients, I think it should stay there. Okay. And then my understanding of HIPAA, again, has, has some holes, but asking vaccine status from employees is not a violation. No. Um, so the the Hep B vaccine, I think we're fine on the communicable disease, but I I don't know the details on that. I don't think we're asking for that. Um, it, right. It just says you shouldn't do it if you have it. Right. And and I guess the question for a, a tattoo shop owner would be, does that mean I should ask, or is that just something that we are assuming everybody? you know, knows that about themselves and wouldn't go to work with that. Um, I think we have to leave, like people know that they are, that's their responsibility. And if they have that diagnosis, they should, shouldn't be going to work. Like, um, like with, with other kinds of occupations as well, you wouldn't go to work if you're, sick and you're going to make somebody else sick it like some of these skin infections and uh other other risk i again it i think there's a lot of common sense involved in terms of risks and using uh, universal precautions with gloves and you know we don't talk anything about masks in this setting um but 
I think we've all learned a little bit about preventing respiratory infection spread uh, with masks and other things. Um, I I didn't see that in any other body art establishment, like any other regulations around body art. Um, none of them, I think, were in the last three years. I <laughs> so. And just to reiterate, then, I definitely would take HIV and Hep B off of the definition of communicable diseases because we don't want to limit HIV right. positive people from being able to do the work. Right. It's not I think that that's what I recognize right. that that there are situations where that's not a good idea. And that's something that the physician, the person's physician and uh, our practitioner and and the should just have that discussion about what it, what it, what's safe and what's not safe. And for the most part, with universal precautions, all these types of procedures would be considered safe. Um, the other thing, I know we're, we're jumping around a little bit, but I think that's one change I think we will do, we'll, we'll make, I, I would propose we make. Another one is the thing you mentioned, Risha, in our last meeting, and I was hesitant to make a change right then because everything was going out the door for publication. But the idea of gloves, what are gloves? I think we need a, a definition, to add a definition for gloves. And I have one to propose that I, that I found. Um, let me find it now. It says, here's my suggestion. Cause I found what I learned was that there are medical grade gloves that are, they have a lower chance of ripping or tearing than um, something for utility gloves or for food service gloves. Um, so it, here's what I found. Gloves shall mean medical grade, single use disposable gloves that meet the ASTM standard for medical examination gloves or surgical gloves as required by the CDC. And so medical gloves are less fitted than surgical gloves. Uh, that's sort of the main difference. And some people might, for this kind of work, use surgical gloves, which would be absolutely fine. And medical gloves are usually for more examination. Um, and the ASTM, I have a definition for that, but it's a it's a it's a material. It's a standards organization. I don't know if we need to include that definition as well, but we could if we wanted to. Great. And then uh, to make that consistent, we would need to go through and take out any reference to type of glove throughout the text. So it just says gloves and it goes back to that definition. Because my concern was that it sometimes said medical gloves, sometimes said disposable gloves. And I didn't want people to have to have two types of gloves and oh, over right. Burden. Um, right. I, I could do that, I guess. Um, that definition sounds fine to me. Okay. So we can change the changes about gloves, changes about HIV, Hep B. Um, you talked about potentially removing the criminal background provision. Yeah, I actually make an argument for keeping that. I think it's not, uh, it's kind of a standard request for someone who's um, has an interaction with the public on this, like similar to this, like a, uh, a nurse or nurse practitioner or a physician or mm -hmm. uh, any, any kind of contact like this seems to, seems like it's not too high of uh, big an ask to try to make sure that there is an, uh, an excessive risk involved. And did you say that, that that wasn't in the regulations before, but it, it was, was, it was we not? Did, we did not have it in the regulations before. Many other um, towns and cities oh, do. Too. I mean, Risha, I know you, you had said something about that, so I just was wondering what your thoughts were about it. 
I would rather take it out. Um, but it, it's, I don't know how this goes, if it's a consensus or majority rule. Um, we could vote on these things. Why would you like to take it out? It just seems like a barrier that doesn't provide a lot of protection. So, you know, if if we think about being with children, that there's all these regulations that the parents have to be there and sign the, the, the things. And um, it just, it feels like a, even though we are saying right now that this wouldn't necessarily make someone not get a license, that might not be something that is known in the application process. And so it might affect hiring decisions uh, or it might affect someone's willingness to apply. And I don't want to create unnecessary barriers if we aren't actually doing any, if it doesn't mean you can't provide the service, uh, it, I, the, the cost value thing to me doesn't line up. So that's my reasoning. Any other thoughts about that, this? Well, I, I can't remember who <clears throat> mentioned this. Um, but it, it, I think there was some comment about how it might be helpful to have the information if an incident comes up. Um, that's what I recall was said. I, I'm not quite sure how, I mean, I get, I get what you're saying, Risha. Um, it, it seems like a standard provision, um. I guess I would say it's the only argument and I'm not necessarily saying that that's the reason to do it, but. Mm -hmm. I favor to keep it only because uh, just like any other information they are providing, you know, uh, it gives the full information of a particular apprentice, you know, uh, uh, it, I don't think it creates a barrier, uh, in my opinion, because we are asking for all sorts of things like social security numbers and <laughs> date of births and a lot of things, you know, which, which could be used for discrimination. Uh, but that's not the ma main, main reason. I think the information might be useful to actually get the background of, of an individual who is going to interact with the public, you know. Um, and I was the one who mentioned that if there is any incident uh, which might be coming up in the future, there might be some sort of a disinformation might be useful. You know, I didn't look to see if things like where the state licenses, you know, barbers or cosmetologists or whatever, whether that's a, that would be a similar um standard or not I honestly didn't didn't look at that um I feel like it's a it's a potentially um sensitive issue and maybe it is something that you all want to research a bit more before making a decision as you said Maureen um mm -hmm. Yeah, it might make sense if, for us to take it a, a breath and look at that. Yeah. Uh, one thing we did drop was a high school diploma because that was considered a barrier. Yeah. You know, just an age of 18. And, and so that was something we did try to do to lower that barrier. Um, and that was actually Stephen's recommendation. And other towns like Northampton did not have that. Um, Um, not to belabor the point, but just so, so I understand um, the logic. So if an incident happened and presumably, you know, someone makes a complaint or there's a lawsuit or some such thing, um, and then we say, okay, well, we see on this, this license form that this person has a history of whatever, how does that help?
well at that stage it may not help much <laughs> uh, but at least you know we have that information earlier um, 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 you know if an incident happens later on it, it's a, again a learning process you know so maybe that is something could be a should be a part of the criteria uh, i just uh, reviewed the cosmetology licenses okay they have, they have to complete a cori as part of the web application mm -hmm. that's in massachusetts right Ooh. why the state doesn't you <laughs> regulate these the body art ones i don't know but in any case all the towns are on their own to kind of figure this out um i guess what was it, why was i thinking of this i mean i feel like this is a fairly intimate um contact with with piercing of very possibly intimate sites and if you found that someone had a significant past history of being what a sexual predator or something and you didn't know that and you gave them the license is that okay i i don't know i think that's like one in a billion risk of that happening but um but there is a little bit of responsibility here um you know these aren't big organizations where there are lots of people around um they're just could be just two people in in the setting um i don't know i might be more inclined put something in that specific like that mm -hmm. um, because I do understand that risk um, but I worry about you know I had a weed charge in my when I was 19 and and now I you know this shop might hesitate to give me a job because they know I have to declare it on my license and, um, right. and that might not happen and so maybe it is worth being more specific on that Yeah, I think that would, like you said, I think the board would probably not take, make that an issue. Um, but I can see your concern about it being a threshold issue of being outed or somehow uh, keep, might keep, keep someone from applying for a job or going and starting to go into this field. I, yeah, sorry, I was going to slightly change the topic. Um, so let me, finish, yeah, if there's anything finished on this. I think, I guess we're going back to the drawing board on this a little bit and is going to do a little more research and then come back to it at our next meeting. So let's put that one to, to, to rest. It. Um, it, any it'll other? Be yeah, it'll be helpful to know, um, what is the reason uh, applicants of barbering and cosmetology are required to do a CORI uh, submission in their application? So if we can go back and see, you know, what they, why they are requiring that, that might help us to actually make a decision, you know, because barbering and cosmetology looks like, you know, interacting with public, you know, and mm -hmm. how do they yeah. use that one? You know, do they use it or do they not use it? And I think if, if we can review that application process, it will help us in our own decisions. Okay. Yeah. So Misha, you had another area that you wanted to look into? Uh, as I was trying to look at uh, the Massachusetts licensing for tattooing uh, to see if there was a criminal record referenced, uh, it does say two years um, for apprentice. And so I'm wondering if it's the piercing that is three years in some places or where are you finding this? I don't, I, I guess I, I went through, cause there's no, there were some, there's a template, I guess. I didn't think there was a Massachusetts template for body art apprentices. There's town by town. And I really followed closely, um, Northampton, and I think East Hampton is the same. It, and it does, I mean, it's, 
it's mind boggling. I think to, to, but I think piercing was only one year actually apprenticeship with two years of like a provisional license. And, um, and tattooing was two years of apprenticeship with one year provisional license. And to have a full license, people need to have three years of experience. So it, I think they, they, it, I think it's to make them all line up so that it's about a three year experience, then you have your full license. Like if someone came from another city or town or state or whatever, the, the, the requirement for the license was three years. So I think it's to make things equivalent over over those categories. Um, and I'm happy to have somebody go into the weeds on this because it, it drove me pretty crazy when I was looking at it and trying to trying to make make it make sense to me. I mean I think the the logic of having it match the bigger towns of, of Northampton and East Hampton nearby makes sense to me. So if that's the case, then I would I'd support it. Um, but I just wanted to look in because I was looking for something else and then saw two years. Um, I yeah. wanted to flag it. And it looks like it's just giving a, a overview of Massachusetts and they say most require two years. I see. Of apprentice. I see. Uh, they don't list the actual towns that do or don't. Mm -hmm. So, so I guess for all of us, we can maybe try to look at some of the highlight highlights that that uh, Stephen brought up, and and come back next month with some ideas about how we want to proceed on those issues, and I guess. The primary one is is the criminal record. The secondary, the gloves. I can I can do that easily. That's not hard. Um, you can double check on the apprenticeship length, but I think that is consistent with what I said. <laughs> um, and the whole communicable disease thing. It, it is. It they are guidelines that say. You, we want we want to know about health issues. Uh, they they ask um, clients about health issues that make them at higher risk for complications of of this procedure, but it doesn't mean they can't have it. Um, and and it asks that practitioners are healthy and don't have a com communicable disease that is currently contagious. I guess in the setting. Um, but also emphasizes the precautions. As far as Hep B goes, it's pretty standard for people who work in risky situations um, that they are offered hepatitis B vaccine. They may decline, but they need to sign that they decline and that they need to have training in universal precautions for, for safety. So I think that's a pretty standard approach. Um, would I like to know people's status? Maybe that would be helpful, but it, it's not. It's not a necessary part of this. Um, uh, I think there were there were three other things that Stephen mentioned that I made note of. Mm -hmm. um, there was a comment about the piercing guns that can't be properly sanitized. Well. There are different ones now that come with a cassette, and this is something that isn't isn't included in the. I don't think it's included in the piercers. Don't use them. Uh, it's like uh, it's not regulated. Okay. In our in this setting, it, it it's sort of outside of the regulations. Um, we could just ban them altogether. I mean, we, I don't know of anybody that uses the hydrates. Is Claire still in the mall doing that? I think the, those have changed in the last many years since my Claire's kids. Claire's left the mall. <laughs> Claire's <laughs> left the mall. So then I don't think there's anybody else out there with one of those guns. I actually bought my own when my kids were, 
for a little because I didn't like the idea of them. But we, it's possible just we could decide to just ban those entirely. Um, I think they're better now than they used to be because they come with a cassette that's totally replaceable. And it's not quite the way the old ones were. But it's also the piercers don't like them because I think they say it causes more trauma that, because the earring itself is big and not that sharp. And it causes more trauma to the tissues. And it's not it's not a good way to pierce. Um, but I, I looked for reference to the gun. There is no ver there's no word gun in the document. No, it's I, like I assume, a, I assume it's talking about the exemptions of uh, individuals yeah. who only pierce who pierce ear. only the lobe with a pre-sterilized single use stud and clasp ear piercing system. Is I assume yeah, that's the well, system. I right. think they they aren't even always well. The system there's some now there's some things that are just like a cassette, and you just like press them and those although they might not be the ideal way to pierce in the ear but those should be fine so I'm, I'm not sure we need to to change that um because the way the way I looked at them they were single use and they didn't reuse a an implement to to do that um like that that was in touch with somebody's body or their bodily fluids. But, and my read of this is saying that this document does not apply to people using right. those products. systems, right. right. Um, and so I, I think Stephen was actually saying yes, because they are not used by pe pe licensed peers. Right, right, uh, they're not. Okay. They're not. And I think, I think as Tim pointed out, the, the, the tradition of piercing young children, you know, it, it's, a, you know, a, some, it's popular in different, at different times. And also in certain cultures, there's a lot of piercing of, of even very young children, uh, earlobes, and we don't want to interfere with that practice. So, um, That's, thank you. I, I think there were two other things. I'm just trying to be thorough that I know to be. No, I, I think we want to know what we're going to do. Yeah. I mean, I think we've, we've covered the really um, significant ones. The other thing, uh, two other things um, was about the um, the things that are prohibited, what is not allowed. Um, and Stephen said guest artists may want to do some of these things. You, I think maybe you want to address that. And then the tattoo parlors, um, the open concept tattoo parlor versus the... Um, whatever you, the stalls or whatever you might call them. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, the, the actual list of, of, of band types of piercing or body art came from really from Northampton. So mm -hmm. I, I was trying to make it similar to the other towns in our area. Um, and those are also in many other, other, parts of the state as well. That that particular list I found many places. It's very hard to research which body art practices are higher risk. There's not a lot of data, but um, but but and actually even I went to sites for like for like piercers. There are a couple of, of websites of associations for piercers and for tattoo artists. And one, at least one of the piercing sites had a bunch of things that they thought were not a good thing to do. So that, that so all piercings are not good things to do, but um, I think I think this broadens our, our field mm, immensely uh, compared to the previous uh, previous regulation. So I think it's the right way, the right step to take. Um, if, if the, yeah, I, like I said, I don't think there was a step-by-step -step of this particular thing, this particular procedure has a lot of data about how many complications there are, but um, but these were kind of generally recognized as higher risk. 
and the lab and the open concept. I hadn't heard of that before. I didn't see anything about that. Those 45 square feet areas that are partially separated. I think with piercing, it has to be have full walls, but with, with uh, tattooing, it can be partial walls. Um, I couldn't try to find some regulations that mention open concept shops, but I hadn't seen that. So we have a little more homework to do. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm glad we're at this stage where we really are honing in on this um, and, and pinning, pinning things down. I'm really, really happy that people are really looking at this carefully. So, all right. Any other comments on this for tonight? All right. I'm going to have to watch the video of this and get all or get the, the details from the minutes. Um, so where are we on our... I've lost track of my agenda. Here it is. So we're now up to new business. And I was just going to bring up this idea I was thinking we were done with body art, but we have a little more to do um, that there might be some additional attention needed for the tobacco sales regulations. Those were revised in either, in either 2020 or 2021. So they're pretty much up to date, but I did attend a session um, at the, put on by, by the Massachusetts Health Offers Officers Association and Pioneer Valley Tobacco Control Co Collaborative on uh, September 13th, 2023, that raised a few issues that we might wanna uh, strengthen our regulation or tighten some of the wording. One is that um, there are new products that are called, you know, referred that are non-menthol cooling sensation producing chemicals. And those are uh, being marketed as menthol light, basically. It's like a non-menthol Newport cigarette and a cool Lux, and they don't have menthol, but they have this, it's this chemical. It's uh, WS3, menthol carbox, and it doesn't taste like anything but changes the taste or effect of, of the product. So that was one thing. The other thing, we had some issues with our adult only tobacco retailers definition where people try to think, try to, uh, people from a, who were taking over a, um, a liquor store said that they're store was um, adult only and therefore could sell cigarettes. And it really wasn't, but if you looked at the wording of our regulation, it kind of leaves a little bit of an opening. So I think that should be tightened. And then there are other misleading products like vapes without any flavor or any, any uh, nicotine and what you do with those. So again, I, I think it's just worth our, our looking at uh, again. And I don't know if there's anybody willing to just take that on and um, start doing that. The, the good part of this is the tobacco, Pioneer Vacuum Tobacco, tobacco Control um, Collaborative and the Massachusetts Association of Health Boards can be really helpful because they have model model regulations and resources where you can talk to people and have them review your your um, regulations and how 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 to how to write them so it's not as hard as the body art has been so is so i don't know if there's anyone who's interested in Step, stepping forward. I think traditionally we've had one or two people be the point 
people on, on a project like this and kind of bring it back back to the board. I don't see people jumping, so I would be willing to do it. Okay. I'd also be willing to not do it if someone really wants to. I'd be willing to um, work with you on that, Risha. Great. Because uh, Tim and I, <laughs> I we, this this was a long, I think it actually preceded the time when Tim and I were on the board, actually, where the where the current regulations were in process. So it it took many years this last time. Um, it was more complicated. And we're fortunate that we're pretty up to date on the state regulations now. And it's not going to be quite the heavy lift it was at that time. So, all right. And so now we have some geothermal wells for first for 49 Kestrel Lane. Now is Ed here tonight or do we just have his um, his letter? Yeah, he's not able to attend this evening. So he just, we sent ahead the materials that he prepared. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I must say, I'm not terribly conversant on this topic. So I was hoping that people reviewed what he sent. And maybe you all have some experience having reviewed these before, I think. Yeah, we ha have, sir. There have been a, a number of these in the last couple of years. Um, and they're all quite, quite similar. Um, I, from from my experience of the last couple of years, I didn't see anything that stood out as problematic, but I would turn to Tim, who's our environmental uh, <laughs> scientist. <laughs> Did you see any, any concerns in those? I think, you know, Ed has mentioned something about um, being careful in the work area not allowing the turbid waters to travel towards a jurisdictional resource area. I'm not sure what he means by that. Uh, in his in his letter, I think he mentions that, you know, so uh, that's more related to um, practices to minimize any type of a turbid water running off from the site. Uh, if that That's the only thing I'm I have concern, but other than that, I think we had been approving these uh, installations because they, they are closed loop. Mm -hmm. um, they don't have much of spills. Even if a spill, it's not it's not like a toxic chemical spilling out. It's a food grade. Um, so I think we, you know, we should approve, you know, make, making sure uh, uh, its recommendation on Taking care of the runoff water uh, is is some sort of a monitored and prevented, mm -hmm. you know. Did, I don't. I'm not at home, and I don't think I copy those documents. Um, did he mention anything about conservation com conservation commission involvement? No, I think he mentioned that it's outside the. CONCOM jurisdiction. Okay. Okay. So it's I not a resource area or wetland or something like that. Okay. I think it's kind of close, but probably not right. Yeah. Not as not per the regulations. Um and it was a it was a two bore well, which is two a bore. simple two simple uh project relatively. Um that and we've approved things like this before. I I agree that we can, uh, uh we can approve this, um, application. Um, Farisha, I don't know if you're familiar with the geothermal. Have you heard seen this before? No, it's different. I um, I offer no value in this conversation. <laughs> okay. Um. Yeah, basically, those the they drill down and and insert a pipe that connects at the bottom, you know, bottom of this deep site and and comes up the other side. So so there's no interchange with the groundwater or or 
at all. It, it should all stay within the system. And the only thing that moves back and forth is heat. Um, and like Tim said, the only, it's basically water with maybe a very non-toxic kind of antifreeze, propylene glycol or something uh, in it. And, um, and with the limited number of wells, it, it, it's, it's pretty simple. Um, so I, I, does anyone have questions about this? this? Should we have a motion to vote to approve? Yeah, I can make a motion to approve uh, the application for a geothermal well on 49 Kestrel Lane in Amherst. And I can second that. Um, Pramila, you want to vote? Aye. Tim? Aye. Maureen? Aye. Misha? Aye. Okay. So that well is approved. The second part of this and is what the process should be going forward. And I think the question there is whether each and every one of these applications needs to come before the board because they're relatively, generally relatively straightforward. But we, I guess we might wanna have criteria for when they, should come before the board. Tim, do you have any thoughts about that? So I would recommend um, the number of wells as a criteria. Um, mm -hmm. I, I would say if it's more than two wells, and I think it should come to the board. Okay. Uh, if it's like, you know, one well or two wells, I think it, it, should, it should be decided by Ed, you know, it's very easy. But I have seen, you know, if there is a very large installation, uh, we should consider to review it. That's one thing. The second thing is, if it is very close to a, a resource area, like say, for example, water supplies or wetlands, uh, or even downstream, if there is any potential public sites, like public, um, like schools or um I mean, those types of situations, I think, even though Ed might have a approving letter, uh, it'll be good for the board to just have a quick review. Um, the two criteria, one is number of wells. Mm -hmm. And the second criteria is if it is having any impact on local resource areas. What I mean by that is uh, potential impact on water supplies or any public uh, um, public areas which are downstream to it mm -hmm. or, or wetlands so those are things I would be I you know I would I would like to have the board to review it all right um when you say two wells you mean like this one that we just approved exactly is... yeah often what we've seen are people have like two different um zones and they'll have two different units so they'll have four bores is that um i guess that's i wondered if if that exceeds the number we should oh why i was thinking of that you know number is because there are potential proposals which are going to have much more higher number of wells mm -hmm. And uh, and and higher density of wells, right? And and those in those cases, I think, even though they may they, it's all closed loop systems, they may not have any potential impacts on groundwater. But still, having dense insulations, you know, uh, potential concern, you know, if if there is some sort of a, uh, a disturbance to your, you know. Uh, uh, land landforms itself, I think, you know, these are like a very you know, big installations. So mm -hmm. I think if the unit, which is actually two wells, and then if they, if they are applying for that one type of unit, that will be fine. I mean, if it's um, twice that applied, I think that's also fine, I think. Okay. 
like if it's that would be four wells right yeah yeah one that i guess I, you know for me <laughs> I was trying to think of a number too as well. Um, and I, last year I was looking at this and I was reading some things from the state and some of it was old and it used to, have, they used to require a state permit for these geothermal wells, but they changed that in maybe 2017. So it was fewer than five wells that it didn't need that permit. So I was thinking, well, maybe that's, a number that's reasonable and and it's a number that we've seen we've we've seen mostly two sometimes four uh wells on a property but i i agree anything more than that and i guess the thing that's coming down the road is going to be the fort river yeah school the school is going to have like what 190 or so i forget it's some really really big Good number luck, yeah um and so that will, the state will be involved in, I think as well, but we probably should be there. I don't know if you would be willing to like enumerate the, the concert, you know, those sensitive areas for us. I Yeah, I, I can do that. Yeah. Yeah. That would I mean, be we, could, we could do with two, uh, four wells, yeah. um, which will be a reasonable one. Yeah. And I, I could enumerate those, some sort okay. of a basic criteria, you know, so. Okay. And I don't know if you need to have numbers of feed and all of that stuff, but, um, uh, yeah. cause yeah. All right. Well, that would be great. That would be great. Now that, because then, um, because for the most part, we've been just like looking at Ed's letter and, and everything's fine and just voting on it and, um, without much added value. Yeah. All right, all right. So we got a plan for that. Um, so now we're at the director's update. Yeah, well, I, and I just wanted to add that that's great. I'm glad you established some criteria. And I think, um, you know, there might be some unusual circumstances if something's contested or something's really, you know, different then that would be something that would come to the board. Um, he sort of said it, it could be analogous to what happens with septic, with Title V used to approve every single one and now you don't do that any longer and so something mm -hmm. along those same lines so that that's mm -hmm. helpful i think it's a good conversation uh okay so director's update let's see um i um i mentioned in our last meeting that we had a number of covid and flu vaccine clinics planned for late october november so those have all concluded um we had successful vaccine clinics um in collaboration with the Northampton Department of Health and Human Services through the Public Health Excellence Grant, which has funds for regional work. So they bring all the vaccine, all the staff, they organize everything. It's a well-oiled machine. They do a great job. So we had a really successful one at Clark House where we saw almost a third of the residents there for either flu, flu COVID, or both. Um, then we did something at Craig's Doors, um, mostly guests and staff of Craig's Doors um, with a few other walk-ins. There were 18 people, I think, there. There were 30-something at um, Clark House. So that's there are about 100 people who live in that building. So that was really successful. Um, and we plan to do that on an annual basis. It was very well received at Clark House. Um, and then we did at the Bank Center just this past Tuesday, we had a community clinic, which we promoted pretty widely on our website and just to people walking by the health department. So that was in conjunction with election day. It was not nearly as busy as I thought it might be. I was afraid we were just going to be swamped with people. Um, so it wasn't like it wasn't a sort of crowd control nightmare, which I was happy about. But we did see a number of people we had. 87 appointments and 20 walk-ins, a number of whom were folks who had come to vote and thought, oh, well, it's Christmas, I'm gonna get my vaccine at the same time. So they just popped in to get a vaccine and it was again, very smooth and um, well-received. Uh, it was nice to be able to offer both COVID and flu. Mm. Um, so, so it was so well received, I think that we're thinking about maybe doing one more before the end of the season with Northampton, because um, I think as I've mentioned before, because the COVID vaccine is commercialized. We don't have large supplies of it. We only have a small amount that's only for uninsured and underinsured. Whereas at these clinics, the Northampton folks collect people's insurance information and they bill people's insurance. So they won't turn anybody away. They see anyone insured, uninsured, doesn't matter. Um, so that's a very, very nice flexibility that they have with these clinics. 
So that was successful. I mean, our, the staff put quite a, a bit of energy into organizing that, promoting that, and um, mm -hmm. we're happy that those went well. Any that's questions? good. Yeah. Well, that's <laughs> so. Yeah, you don't know how many people will want to walk in. I guess. Yeah. I noticed. I I looked in it. All the appointments had been taken when I looked at it, so I thought that was good. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, in the end, I think we had some people who didn't show for appointments. I mean, that always happens. You make plans mm -hmm. and exchange. Um, but overall, it was, it was you know, busy and just in all the right ways. So that was good. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't, just on, on the COVID theme, we're also giving away COVID tests at the health department. We were able to get um, 1,800 free tests from the, from the state. And so we ordered those. They came very quickly. And people are overjoyed because they've been coming by the office for weeks on end asking about COVID tests and we never had any, but now we have a lot. So we're giving those away and it's great. It's just good for people to have those as a resource, especially with the holidays coming up and people, you know, gathering in person. Um, the next item about inspection division staffing changes is about Ed's role, um, which is that he is going to be promoted to a lead code enforcement role. Um, that was the job that John, I don't remember his last name, had before retiring. Um, I Probably you all know him. Um, so Ed will be moving into that role. It's more of a supervisory role and I think well-deserved for him. He's such a great inspector and so knowledgeable. So um, currently John, uh, Ed and Susan are managing the work of three people. They're just the two of them and they're doing, since John retired, the work of three inspectors. When Ed moves into that role, they'll be hiring another inspector. So they'll be back to a team of three. Um, so they're a little bit understaffed right now, um, but they're still managing to keep up with the work and do well. And I've been working with them closely. It's been really, you know, educational for me. So that's been really a good experience so far. So that's that staffing update. And congratulations to Ed. Well-deserved. Mm -hmm. we'll um, we don't have him coming up for all. Of yeah, he might not be coming well. to meetings as much. Yeah, yeah. We'll see how that plays out. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, and then anything else about that? Okay. Uh, so the toxic chemicals resource page. So we, um, uh, we have something almost ready to go. I had hoped to be able to tell you it's on the web by today, but we, we've been just a little bit busy with these cl clinics, getting these clinics done. So what we've designed is sort of a brief landing page for the, for the website that will be um, similar to what you see for air quality. When you go to our air quality page, just has a couple of sentences and then a few links. So from that page, we will link to the longer document, um, Tim, that you and Kyle worked on, which I reformatted just a little bit to make it, you know, pop, look a little better, you know, sort of um, flow a little better, be a little bit more reader friendly for the reader. And then we'll add all of these links for um, alternatives to toxic chemicals that people can use as a first step in community education with more to come in the future. So next time I see you all, that will be up and live. And uh, we'll send you a note when we get it up just so you can check it out when it's there. Thank you. Yeah. I don't think I have anything else. Those are my, those were my three items. I don't know if there are any other questions for me. Okay. Um, any topics unanticipated? I, I haven't heard of any topics unanticipated by the by the chair. You had a question about releasing the video to a person. Oh, oh yeah, um, Art Keen, the reporter who often comes to these meetings and covers them for the indie. Um, yeah, I resolved that with him, and he said he okay. normally was able to get these recordings. But tomorrow is a holiday for us in the town, so. Um, it's going to, I think he's actually not doing yes. that after all. So yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, all no right. Problem, no problem with that. No but problem. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, all right. Um, anyone have other questions for Pico or thoughts? All right. I guess we can go ahead to uh, look for a motion to uh, close the meeting. 
Yeah, I can make a motion to adjourn our Board of Health meeting on November 9th. Okay. I'll second that. Uh, Pramila? Can't hear you. Pramila? My screen just disappeared. On <laughs> okay. <laughs> It didn't look bad. It looked the same then. <laughs> well, it just, it just sort of, I, I must have hit a button accidentally. I'm but sure anyway. fine. That happens. That happens. Aye. So, okay. Risha? Aye. Tim? Aye. Maureen? Aye. And so our next meeting is scheduled for December 14th at 5.30. Yeah, I, I don't know if it's useful. I will not be able to join. I will be out of, I will be traveling that day. Okay. I'll miss you. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah, well, that'll help us make the agenda. We won't bring up this tobacco thing again for a while till January. Okay. I'm happy to talk with you uh, yeah. outside of the meeting and figure out where, how, how to start on that. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Great. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. everybody. Bye. Comings and goings of this evening. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for your patience Bye. with everything. Take care.